Praise the Lord. We welcome you this evening. Glad that you're here. Why don't you please be seated if you would. Welcome to Jesus is Lord Outreach Center. Glad that you are here. Praise God. We're going to receive our offering, but first of all, we want to greet those that are here for the first time. Praise the Lord. We're glad this one gentleman over here for the first time. We're glad that you are here. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're going to receive our offering as we minister unto the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to bring of our tithes and offerings to you. We give freely, we give excitedly, we give because we want to. As we sow, we know we're going to reap, and we thank you that you're multiplying the seed zone. You're causing all grace to abound toward us, that we have all sufficiency in all things and may be able to abound to every good work. Father, thank you for meeting the need of every individual in this place, according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, please wait on the people, if you would, please. <clears throat> Hallelujah. We're going to be praying for all men and praying for our nation before we get into the Word. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you and we praise you as we pray for every person to be born again. Father, we thank you it is your will for all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We thank you as we pray. We bind all the evil spirits that have deceived people from receiving Jesus. We loose and untie the blinders off their minds. We command the light of the gospel to shine into their hearts, to bring the revelation of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for opening the eyes of the multitudes, bringing them to the place of repentance and receiving Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for the great harvest of souls you are bringing forth in these last days. Father, we do continue to pray for this nation. We bind the principalities, powers, rulers, the darkness, spiritual wickedness, and the heavenly places. We cast them down, throw them down, and root them out and fall upon them to their destruction. We thank you for sending forth the warring angels doing battle to destroy all the works of the enemy. We thank you for continually bringing forth the revelation of the corruption that has been going on in this nation. Thank you, Father, for revealing it. And thank you, Father, for the populace rising up and demanding righteous government. Father, we thank you as we bind all these spirits and cast them all down, that you're shaking this nation and doing whatever is necessary to bring it to repentance. Father, we thank you that you are wiser and more powerful and mighty than all the enemies. And we thank you that you, oh, you respond to your word because we are your people called by your name who do humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. We know that you hear from heaven. You forgive us our sins. We know that you heal our land. We thank you that you're doing it. Thank you for shaking this nation, doing whatever's necessary to accomplish a restoration to righteousness. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God for what he is doing. Please stand with me if you would. We're going to pray as we get into God's Word this evening. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for your Word, which is the truth. We receive your Word this night, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We are hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of healing. We've talked about the fact that we have a covenant with God. He is the Jehovah, Je Je Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals us. We talked about the fact that He's the one who heals us of all of our diseases, Psalms 103, verse 3. We talked about the fact that Jesus is the one who took our infirmities and bore away our sicknesses, and by His stripes we were healed. Healing now belongs to us as our right in Christ. We talked about the fact that it is a doctrine of the church and that we are now to receive healing as a promise of God. We talked about the fact that we have authority over all of the works of the enemy and that God is a performer of his word and he will bring forth his healing. He will bring forth his restoration as we do what the word says. Tonight we're going to go through the New Testament and look at healing in the ministry of Jesus and, and the also in those in the book of Acts. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23 and 24, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. 
First, you would teach the Word to them, and that's important. We need to teach the Word to people first so that then they have the Word in them and they can be in faith and respond to the Gospel. And notice, he was healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. His fame went throughout all Syria. They brought into him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, those that were possessed with devils, those that were lunatic, those that had the palsy, and he healed them. The good news is Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hadn't changed a bit. He is still the healer of all sickness and all disease and setting people free from all bondages of the enemy. We see in Matthew chapter 8, when he came down from the mountain, the great multitudes were following him. And there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He believed that Jesus had the power to make him clean. But his question was, if you will. Many Christians today are still battling that question. Is it really God's will to heal me? Absolutely. Jesus dealt with that immediately. He put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Notice, notice Jesus dealt with that, I will. But also notice what he did. He did two things. He touched him, the doctrine of laying on of hands, releasing power flowing forth from him, and he spoke words, commanding words, be thou clean. That's what we do. We lay hands on people and we speak commanding words, be clean, be healed in the name of Jesus. As you speak commanding words, you're releasing him to accomplish that. We see over in Matthew chapter 8, we come to verse 5, and there was a centurion. He came to Jesus Beseeching him, as it says in verse 5, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. When Jesus says it, it's going to happen. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Remember, he was a Roman. He wasn't an Israelite. He wasn't one in the covenant. But he says, speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. He knew something. He knew that if we will speak the word, it will release the healing power of God to bring forth healing. He said, For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say this man go and he goeth, to another come and he cometh, to my servant do this and he doeth it. The key here is the fact that he was under authority to those above him in Rome. He was in authority because of that, and he understood how authority works. You and I must be under authority to the Father in heaven in line with the Word of God. Then we're in authority so that we can speak forth to those that we have dominion over. And you have dominion. You are in authority over all of the works of the devil, all sickness and disease. And he understood how authority is released by commanding words. You are going to speak commanding words. You command, as he said, go and he goeth, come and he cometh, do this. As a servant, and do, he doeth it. And Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. This is considered great faith because he understood that authority is released through speaking words. And he spoke forth those words. And what happened to him? The centurion said to the, Jesus said to the centurion in verse 13, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. As you and I believe, so will it be done unto us. All things are possible to him that believeth. We must speak commanding words. We must believe. And as we act upon his word, he is a performer of it and will bring forth healing and restoration. We see in verse 14, Jesus was coming to Peter's house. He saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand. The doctrine of laying on of hands. What happened when he touched her hand? Healing power went into her. And the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. You and I have, can release power through the laying on of hands. God wants you to get full of power through the Word of God in you. He wants you to get full of the Holy Spirit through praise and worship and prayer so that you can release that power through the anointing of the Holy Spirit that can bring forth healing, and this, that's what happened in this situation, touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose, and she was healed. Praise God. Verse 16, 
Even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits, the King James says, with his word, and healed all that were sick. Notice the word his is italicized. You can see it there when you look at it, and when you put the cursor over it, there's no word there, no Greek word under it, because it shouldn't be there. It's not in the Greek. It literally says he cast out the spirits with word, or really the word here means with speech, because he spoke words and re released the power of God. He cast out by speaking words. It wasn't just through speaking the word of God, it was with speech. It's what this would be translated, should be translated as. And healed all that were sick. All. Jesus is a healer of all sickness and all disease. Amen. We see down in verse 28. It was come to, on the other side in this country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear so that no man might pass by by that way. And they cried out, saying, What are we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Thou art thou come to hither to torment us before the time? Notice, they know that there's a time when they're going to be tormented. Time is the word kairos, which means a fixed and definite time. The demons know that they only have a short time. And they know that their time is going to come when they are going to be tormented. And so he says, it was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding. And the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of the swine. And he said, Go. And when they were come, got, come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a deep place into the sea and perished in the waters. And they were all eliminated. And they that told him fled, went their ways in the city, and told everything what was befallen to those that were possessed, the guy that was possessed of the devils. Over in Mark's account, in chapter 5, we see that when the demons were cast out, what happened to this guy? Verse 15 says, And they came to Jesus, see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Mental illness is caused by evil spirits. Jesus delivers us from mental problems by casting out the spirits. And it will bring you to be in your right mind. That's why we must understand that we need to cast out the demons, drive them out of every area so we can be liberated and set free. We go back to Matthew, and we see over in chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 2. They brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. Jesus, seeing their face, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now the word forgiven here is a Greek word, aphiomi, which means to be sent away. In the Old Testament era, which is what this is, because Jesus had not been to the cross, the Old New Testament was not in force, we're under the Old Testament, nobody could have their sins washed away. They could have them covered over, or in this case, they could send them away. And that's exactly what he did. Thy sins be sent away from thee. Behold, certain the scribes said within himself, this man blasphemeth. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Whichever is easier to say, thy sins be sent away from thee, or to say, arise and walk. But you may know that the Son of Man has authority. This word power is the Greek word exousia, which means authority. Normally, Young's has done an excellent job of, of correcting those errors. This is one case where he didn't do it, unfortunately. It should be authority, because that's what exousia means. On earth, to send forth sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, arise. Take up thy bed and go into thy house. Jesus would speak commanding words. He told him to arise and take up your bed. Rise, take up this bed, which again here is the commanding statement. Take up your bed in the imperative mood and go into thine house. Jesus would command release healing power to this person. And man was healed. Of course, he was set free and liberated. Praise God. As we see, he arose, departed to his house. The multitude saw it. They marveled and glorified God, which has given such authority unto men. Again, that's the word exousia. We have authority over all sickness. We have authority to send away the effects of sins. And we do that when we're dealing with inherited generational iniquity curses. It's important to understand that one of the reasons that evil spirits come into us is because of the sins of our forefathers. 
Lamentations 5, 7 says our fathers have sinned and are not, we have borne their iniquities. Numbers 14, 18 says that the iniquity of the fathers are visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Inherited generational iniquity curses come because of the sins of the forefathers. We have authority to remit or send away the effects of those sins that have brought curses upon us. We have that dominion. We use that when we are breaking inherited curses rights to be there, as well as when we're interceding for others, remitting their sins for God to accomplish the things that he purposed, including as we're praying for our nation. So here this guy, he saw the victory come forth. We see in another account of this over in Luke chapter 5, after this, Luke chapter 5, we pick over here in verse uh, 17, came to pass on a certain day was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power, this is dunamis, truly power, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Why was the power of God present to heal them? Because he was teaching the word. When the word goes forth, the power of God is in the word. And so the power of God was there to heal those, all those people. They brought the man in a bed, take him with a palsy, sought means to bring him in. And of course, he comes down through the, uh, the tiling and uh, with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And this is the same account where he said, thy sins be forgiven or sent away from thee. And so this guy ended up getting healed. It shows you that as the word goes forth, the power of God is present to bring forth healing for those who will act upon the word because he saw their faith. When, G when the Lord sees your faith and you act upon that word, you can receive the healing power of God to flow in. And this is exactly this man got healed and was set free. We see over in Mark chapter 5, another place. Mark chapter 5, here in verse 22, there came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. When he saw him, he fell at his feet, at the feet of Jesus, <clears throat> and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. See, they already knew about Jesus. They saw him laying his hands on people, and they knew that healing power was flowing. Just get your hands on her, she'll be healed. That's why you got to be sure that you are laying hands on people. Don't be afraid to lay hands on people. Your hands are to be a transmission of the power of God to flow into people. So, Jesus went with them. Much people followed him and thronged after him. In the meantime, there's a certain woman, which we'll come back to that in a moment, came with an issue of blood. But then in verse 35, while yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Well, that shouldn't have surprised him because, remember, he said, my daughter is at the point of death. I mean, she was ready to die any day. Why troublest thou the master any further? That's the temptation. Quit, give up, it's all over. Just because the daughter died didn't mean it was all over. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Be not afraid. Jesus, as he speaks these words to him, he is speaking this to him, commanding him, to not let fear get a hold of him. And it says only to believe. God wants every one of us to believe his word, that he is a performer of it. And when he tells them to believe, that's an imperative mood. And he commands us to believe his word, to see the promise of God come to pass. You and I are believers, and we are commanded to believe his word. He is a healer. And if he said he's going to do something in his word, we know he's going to do it. And of course, the result was the man did the right thing. He suffered no man to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, see the tumult, them that wept and wailed greatly. He comes in and said to him, Why make you this ado and a weep? The damsel's not dead, but sleepeth. You know, they laughed him to scorn. When he put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. Took the damsel by the hand and set under her by the hand again, touching her hand. Talitha kumai, which would be interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Jesus spoke commanding words, and she was raised from the dead. Straightway the ramsor, damsel arose and walked, for she was the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. He spoke commanding words and raised her up. God wants us to know that we cannot back off of 
any promise. Do not let fear or circumstances turn you away from the promise of God. If you have a promise, he is a performer of it. And we see that he brought this forth. Do not let fear get a hold of you at all. And notice also he refused to acknowledge that she was dead. He refused to agree with them that spoke of what the devil had accomplished. He instead came to do the work of God. Don't agree with the enemy, agree with God and come and speak forth the commanding word to see the healing power come into a person and bring restoration, praise God. We go back to the woman who had the issue of blood in Mark 5. And this is over here after the, Jesus was on the way to, he, to minister to the, the Jairus' daughter. Verse 25, a certain woman which had an issue of blood for 12 years, she'd suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. It's not saying there's anything wrong with doctors. Doctors are trying to help. But in this case, of course, it didn't solve the problem, because who's the healer? Jesus is the healer. What doctors can do, well, many times, is find out the diagnosis of the problem, so you'll know what to cast out and take hold of healing. At the same time, doctors can help us in areas where maybe we need help and time, before we can see the healing power of God come, let's say you have a diabetes ca case. You know, you don't just decide, well, I'm just going to, you know, just pray that I'm going to be healed and cast out just like that and not take medicine for it. You're going to be in trouble. You know, some Christians think you shouldn't take any medicine. It's wrong. There's nothing wrong with taking medicine. It does not have the curative value. Of course, it's not going to cure you. But what's it doing? It's correcting the imbalances. Otherwise, a person would go in diabetic shock and die. So don't ever fall for that thing that says I should not take any medicine or throw my medicine out. No. We do take that, but does that mean I'm going to stay in that state? No, that's just until I get healed. As I cast out the spirits and take hold of healing, then you'll come to the place where you won't need that. So there's nothing wrong with physicians. They can help you, but remember who's the healer. Jesus is the healer. They're not going to be able to help you get healed. Jesus is the one who brings forth the healing. They're going to help you with the situation while you are in the process of taking hold of the healing. In this case, unfortunately, she spent all she had. She was nothing better, but she even got worse because the devil's the one who's causing all the problems. So she heard of Jesus. Certainly, she heard him teaching about what he, he destroying the works of the devil and the kingdom and healing and all the things that he would do, and came in the press behind and touched his garment. Now, this garment, when he touched the garment, they would always touch the hem of this garment. And in doing so, this was the reminder of the promises of God, because they had this little thing on the end of their garment, which was a reminder of the promises of God that they had. So when she came to touch his, him of his garment, what she was touching, she said, but if I may touch but his clothes, or this garment, same word, I shall be whole. Because he under, she understood, this is the reminder of the promises of God. If I just touch and remind him of the promises of God that he's going to perform, He's going to perform them in my life. When you come and how, say, how do I touch him? With the promises of God, the Word. You're going to touch him when you bring the Word to him because he is the Word. So anytime you believe the Word and you speak the Word, that's how you're making contact with him. And that's exactly what happened. And she said, I shall be made whole. And she was saying this. And she just didn't say this once. As we've already said, we keep speaking things until we see them manifest. This happens to be an imperfect tense verb. The imperfect tense is a continuous tense like the present tense, but it is talking about something that she did in the past. Because from this point in view, it's talking about what she had said previously. It literally would say, for she was saying continuously, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole, or his garment. If I can just touch this garment, reminding the promises of God, which is taking hold of that which belongs to me, then I'm going to be whole. Straightway, it says, the, and so it says, straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue, the word virtue, is the same word for power. It's the word dunamis down here, which is normally translated power. That power had gone out of him, so obviously he didn't see this woman. He didn't know what was happening except that he felt power go out of him. Power had gone out of him. He turned about him in the press and said, Who touched my clothes?
Who touched my garment? That's what it's talking about. Who touched me with the promises of God in order to take hold of the power of God? Of course, the disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and thou sayest, Who touched me? Well, they didn't understand. She, they weren't just touching him, just as touching him as a person. They were touching him for the promises and for the power of God. That's what she was touching. He looked around about to see her that had done this thing. And the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing all that was done, her came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. He said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Why was her faith? How was her faith doing? Her faith was touching Jesus, the, pro the promises. And you and I touch him when we speak forth the promises, the word of God. And that's how your faith is put in operation. Your faith hath made thee whole. She was made whole because of the promise of God that she took hold of. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And that's exactly what happened. We see that faith, your faith, you notice it was her faith that did it. Jesus didn't have anything to do with it. It was her faith that did it. Your faith will make you whole. You have a promise of God. You touch Jesus with, by touching that promise, by bringing that promise to him, and you take hold of that healing power, and the healing power of God will flow into you, and it will bring forth healing. Your faith will make you whole. Praise God. We see over in Matthew, in chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. Jesus departed thence, and two blind men following, crying, saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. Why were they calling him for son of David? They understood that it's all talking about what David had with God. David had a Davidic covenant. He made the covenant called the Davidic covenant, which is the covenant of the kingdom of God. They recognized this is the king. He's the son of David. He's the one who is the king. And so they knew he had rule and reign over the enemies, and they were looking for him to manifest the power of God to heal them. And they called out for mercy. Why were they calling out for mercy? Grace is favor. It is God's attitude towards us. Mercy is that favor being released or the love of God in action toward us. Mercy is always action. And they were looking for the action of healing to come into them. Have mercy on us. And the result is peace. That's why you see in the New Testament, grace, mercy, and peace. God's grace, His favors toward us. His mercy is available we can take hold of, and we can see His peace or His wholeness or His victory or His prosperity in our life. Calling out for it. Came into the house, the blind men came to Him, and Jesus said to him, Believe you that I'm able to do this. Do you believe? Of course, that's another important point. You've got to believe that He is able to heal you of whatever your problem is. They said unto him, Yes, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, again, the touch, the laying on of hands, and saying, According to your faith be it unto you. Jesus released healing power by the touch, but also it was their faith, because they had to believe as they receive that healing power. The Lord is going to do it, but you're going to believe that you receive. Your faith, he said, According to your faith be it unto you. You've got to realize when somebody prays for you, you need your faith in operation. It's not just you sitting and seeing what they're doing. They're ministering, and you're taking hold of it with your faith. According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were open. Praise God. They saw the miraculous healing power of God, and they were restored. We see in verse 32, they went out and brought to a man, dumb, dumb man, possessed with a devil. He had an evil spirit in him. When the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. You cast out the spirit many times, and it causes the healing to come forth without even ministering the healing. In this case, that's what happened. The demon was cast out, and now he was able to speak. The multitudes marveled, saying, it's never been so seen in Israel. Jesus is the one who will deliver us from all of the spirits that have come into us that are the roots behind sickness or disease or problems in our life. That's why we've got to cast out the evil spirits and see God bring forth the healing. Of course, the Pharisees said he was casting out devils through the prince of the devils. It was a lie. But Jesus was doing it, of course, by God's power. 
And Jesus went about all the cities and village, villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Amen. Notice, first you teach the people. Then you preach, which is to declare what he will do. Preaching simply means to proclaim what he will accomplish as he's going to conform his, perform his word. It's not this weird preachy stuff that you see out there in the church world today, all this hypey stuff. That's not what it's talking about. It's just proclaiming those things, what he'll do, having been taught. And then healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Every sickness, every disease. The Lord will heal your sickness or disease, anything that you might have. Don't think that he will not heal you. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. He called unto him his twelve disciples. It wasn't just Jesus doing this. And he gave them power, exousia, authority, against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. All manner, again, all. You see that continually. He's stressing this to us. All sickness can be healed. Well, what they do? They went forth, and what were they to do? Verse 8, he said, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you receive, freely give. You and I can release the authority and the power of God to destroy the works of the enemy. And notice he said, Freely you receive, freely give. That means you never charge money. Anybody who is charging money for anything that is of the Lord, that would include counseling, is sin, is wrong. So, well, shouldn't counselors, you know, they get some money? If they're a part of the church, the church should be paying them based on the money, tithes, and offerings that comes into the church. Otherwise, you don't profit off of the gospel. You freely give it out, and then God will give it back. He goes on and he says, um, down in verse uh, 11, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who is worthy, there abide till you go thence, come into a house, salute it, and then he said that, of course, if they, they didn't receive him, let your peace come upon it, if they received him, let your peace come upon it, but if not worthy, let your peace return to you. It means if you go to people and they won't receive what you say, you just go on to the next person, and you keep on going till you minister to people to help them be set free. God wants us to go forth and to do the works of the Lord. Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. He called his 12 disciples together, gave them power, dunamis, and authority, exousia, over all devils and to cure diseases. Well, they went forth and did it. And he told them to go preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. What's the kingdom? The rule and the reign of God. So as we are declaring that Jesus is the healer and how we heal, why is it? because the rule and reign of God is here. God rules and reigns over all sickness, all demons, everything of the devil. And when we release him, he will destroy all of those works. Praise God. In Matthew chapter 11, we see over here in verse 4. Here's where there were some that came from John. John has been thrown in prison at this time. And when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. And he said, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? They thought he should have had the revelation. He's, remember, he's the one that said, This is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he somehow lost the revelation there, apparently, while he was in prison. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. He needs to be reminded about these things. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. That's all he needed to hear. That goes right back to what it talks about in Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord would be upon him, and he would come to bring all these things. And other scriptures that talk about in the Old Testament that these things were going to be occurring by the Messiah, that Jesus was the one. We see over in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 10, Behold, there was a man that had a hand withered. They asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him? He said to them, What man shall there be among you to have one sheep that fall into a pit on the Sabbath day? They will not lay hold and lift it out. They were all hung up on what day it was, instead of caring about the man getting set free from the problem. How much does a man better than a sheep? It certainly is. It's what law, is, is it what lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? He says, Wherefore it is all lawful to do well. 
Then he said to the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. As the man acted upon what Jesus spoke, it caused the healing power of God to go into him and caused him to be made whole. People need to act upon the word to see the power of God. Faith is shown by action. We believe and then we act and do what the word says. We see in verse 15, when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, the Pharisees were after him. It said, and great multitudes follow him and he healed them all again. We see Jesus healing everybody, every place he went. I mean, there's no limitation. He'll heal every single person of whatever the situation there is. Then we come to verse 22. They brought him to one possessed with a devil. This one was blind and dumb. And he healed him insomuch as the blind and dumb both spake and saw. We see down in verse 28, Jesus says how he did it. He said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. The kingdom is the rule and the reign of God. How do I demonstrate that it's come to you? By casting out the demons because I, the kingdom of God rules over the kingdom of darkness. And so he cast out the demons and saw them be set, call this person be set free. And he says, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house? That strong man is Satan, and the house is the demonic network that's in a person. And spoil his goods, destroy his goods, except he first bind the strong man. You bind Satan first, then he will spoil his house. Then you spoil the house, plunder that house where the evil spirits are. And how do we do that? By casting out all the demons. As you cast out all the demons, it's going to liberate you from bondage and bring healing to you. We see over in Matthew 13, as we've been seeing, he's going and healing everybody. Does that mean that every single person was healed that Jesus came in contact with? No. Because in Matthew 13, 58, it says, He did not many mighty works there, talking about Nazareth, because of their unbelief. That means that those ones who were in faith were the ones who got healed, that believed. But the ones who were in unbelief did not get healed. He could not do many mighty works there because of unbelief. This is why the teaching has to go forth first. And it's not just because you believe, it's they must believe the gospel. You and I must believe. We'd all like to pray for everybody to get healed, but unless they're, of course, born again, right, they have a covenant with God, a right to it, and unless they believe the word themselves, it's not going to happen. They have to believe the promises of God and take hold of it and see it come to pass. We see in Matthew chapter 15, here's the case, verse 22 and following, where the woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and said, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. He didn't answer a word. Why? Because she didn't have a covenant with God. The disciples came to Sodom, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. He answered and said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What's that mean? Jesus only came to those who were in covenant relationship with him, the house of Israel. He didn't come to the Gentiles or the nations of the world. He only came to those in covenant relationship. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She calls him Lord, so she's acknowledging who he is. He answered and said, It's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. What's that tell you? Deliverance is the children's bread. Who does it belong to? Those who are in covenant relationship with God. Who's in covenant relationship with God today? Believers in Jesus Christ. Deliverance is your children's bread. It belongs to us. The dogs were those who were outside of the covenant. But she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She had the revelation that even though it was coming to the Jews right then, that it was going to come to the nations afterwards. It was going to come at a later time. And we know that, and of course, what, what we'll see that, of course, he said, Woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. We know the fact that she understood that from Mark's account. In Mark's account, in Mark chapter 7, this is the same account, and we see down here in verse 29, Here at verse 27, Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled. He didn't say, Let the children only be filled, or say, Let the children be filled, and that's it. No. Let the children first be filled. Well, if they're going to be filled first, that was a key for her. Ah, that means we're going to be filled next. That's right. 
that meant that it was going to come to the Gentiles, to the nations. And she believed that. And because she believed that, that was her faith, a great faith, and she received the deliverance for her daughter because of that. Praise God. You and I have a covenant with God today. Deliverance belongs to you and me. We can cast out all the spirits. We can see the victory come forth in all areas of our life. Matthew chapter 15, we go down to verse 30. Great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Jesus healed them. Nothing that he could not, it was nothing impossible. Insomuch as the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. That's what God wants to do. And that's what he's going to do through the end time church that's going to see the greater glory be manifested because the man in Christ is going to manifest himself before the end comes. And it's going to be through his body, the body of Christ, that's going to come to the place of being holy and are going to do the mighty works of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 17, we come over to verse 14. There came, came to him a multitude, uh, there would come the multitude, and there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. Oftentimes he falls into the fire and often into the water. This guy had mental illness problems, and these demons were doing these evil things to him. I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. They didn't deal with it the way they should have. Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, talking to the disciples, how long shall I be with you? He expected them to be able to have done it. How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Otherwise, you should have been doing this. Bring him to me. Jesus, and so what happened? He rebuked the devil and he parted out of him, departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. And then came the disciples apart to Jesus here and said, why could not we cast him out? Why didn't we have the power, dunamai, form of the word dunamis, why didn't we have the ability, the power, to cast them out? They wonder why it didn't work. Jesus gave them the answer. He said unto them, because of your unbelief. They really weren't believing. I mean, unbelief is going to stop the power of God from working. If you have the slightest bit of unbelief, it will stop the power of God. We should always believe and never doubt whatsoever. <clears throat> And he says, For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. We have authority. We can speak to anything that is not of the Lord, whether it's a demon in a person or a mountain or a blockage, wherever it is, and command it to be removed in the name of Jesus, and it will. But then he adds one other thing. Howbeit this kind, talking about this particular kind of spirit, goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. That doesn't mean that you have to fast when you cast out demons for any, any situation. This is a specific situation where there apparently this kind, this type of a demon, was stronger than the others and they needed to pray and fast in order to be able to cast them out. Again, that doesn't mean that you have to fast to cast out demons. All you need to do is believe. But if you have a problem in an area, then there could be a need to cast out. If you're getting the demons coming out, then you're doing fine. Just keep on casting them out. Remember, it's a network, and you need to keep on casting them out until they're all gone. Matthew 19, here he comes in verse 2. Great multitudes follow him, and he healed them there. Because he was teaching the word, they were responding to it, and they were seeing the healing power of God come into them. We see over in Matthew chapter 20, down in verse 30, here's the two men, blind men again. And they heard Jesus pass by, crying out, said, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. The multitude rebuked him because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more. That meant they weren't going to be denied. Don't let yourself back off. You are going to keep on pressing in until you see the mercy of the Lord. And Jesus stood till, still, called them, What will you that I shall do unto you? Otherwise, he wants to say, what, what, what do you want me to do for you? Where, what, what, where's your will set here? What will you that I should do? He wants to know what, or what does he want you to do, what you want him to do for you, where your will set. That's important. Of course, the result, they wanted to be healed. He said, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So you're going to speak forth these things as you take hold of the healing power of God. 
And Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes. Again, touch. Immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. That's why God wants to get power resident in you so when you touch, power is going to go out of you and flow into other people. That's why you and I must become a reservoir of power through the Word of God abiding in us. And that's what he wants to see come forth. In Matthew chapter 1, 21, we see another case. Verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. They came from all over the place. Jesus was healing them all over the place, just healing them one after another. It must have been astounding. Mark chapter 1, verse 32. That even when the sun did set, they brought unto all that were diseased, them that were possessed with devils. All the city was gathered together at the door. The whole city would turn out. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Notice it doesn't say he healed them all here. It said many. That meant there must have been some of them that were in unbelief. Because that would be the only thing that would hold them back. It wasn't because he decided to heal certain ones and not the others. No, no, he's no respecter of persons. He could only heal many, not all of them. He couldn't cast all the devils out of, the, of all the people because obviously there were some that were in unbelief. We see that what Jesus did in verse 39, it says he preached in their synagogues and throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. That meant every place he went where the covenant people gathered together, which is with synagogue, teaching the word, certainly, and preaching to them, declaring what the kingdom of God would bring forth. He cast out the demons. Jesus wants to cast out the demons in every single church in the world today. Unfortunately, the devil's been very slick and has brought his doctrine of the devil, saying that we don't have any demons in us once we're born again. And that's why 99% of the churches plus don't cast out the demons. They've been totally deceived by the devil, by the doctrine of the devil, and are not doing the will of God. If Jesus came into any church today and he was here in the flesh, He'd come in and preach the gospel, and he'd want to cast out demons. I wonder how many churches they'd let him, would let him come in today. Well, we don't have any demons in us. Ah, it shows you the state of the church today. But there's going to be a change. The remnant is going to come forth, and the mighty church of the Lord Jesus is going to arise in these last days. Mark 3.10, he'd healed many in so much the per they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. Unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried out. I mean, they saw what was in him, who he was, and they absolutely went cra crazy. They fell down and cried out, Thou art the Son of God. They were so, you know, the presence of God, the power of God was so powerful. Mark chapter 6, verse 13, it says, They cast out many devils, anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. We cast out the demons. Anointing with oil is for anointing for healing. It's all simply a type of the Holy Spirit. The oil is a type of the Holy Spirit power flowing into a person because you do these things by the Spirit of God and bring forth healing. We see over in Mark chapter 6, down in verse 55. He ran through the whole region round about. They began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. Every, every, every place he's going, they're bringing people from all over the place. Can you see that? The, you see it in your, your, your mind, essentially? Whithersoever he entered, in the villages, cities, countries, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch it, were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. Healing was continually flowing through him. That's why we got to get the word in us. We got to get the Lord in us totally and get rid of everything that's not of him so that he can manifest himself through us in the same way. In Mark chapter 7, verse 32, here's a guy that was deaf, had an impediment in his speech, they beseech him to put his hand upon him. He took him aside from the multitude, put his finger in his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Ephatha, which means be open. He would always command things. He commanded. He didn't Wonder whether it's going to happen. He did the works because he knew they were going to happen. He spoke commanding words. Be opened. And straightway his ears were opened and the string of his tongue was loosed and he spake plain. Remember he touched all these things and then he spoke the word. God wants you to understand that you can speak the word of God and God will perform his word. Remember, Jesus did nothing of himself. 
Everything he did was of what the Father told him to do. You're not going to do anything of yourself. You're going to do everything what the Word of God says for you to do. Mark chapter 22. He comes to Bethsaida to bring a blind man unto him, besought him to touch him. Took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town. When he spit on his eyes, put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. Now, some people would think, well, that sounds like, how, why should Jesus ask him if he saw aught? If he's, you know, he's releasing the power of God, doesn't that sound like Jesus maybe was in doubt and unbelief here? No. There's, he knew that power went into him. He's just asking, what's the result of the power that went into you? And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Well, Obviously, he couldn't see anything before. Now he can see something. But is he seeing clearly and perfectly yet? No. Then after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. That means Jesus put his hands upon him again. He prayed for him more than once. Is it okay to pray more than once? Absolutely. Lay hands on a person multiple times? Absolutely. Keep praying and releasing the power of God until you see that person be healed and restored and made whole. Over in Mark chapter 10, we see blind Bartimaeus in verse 46. They came to Jericho, and as they went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Every one of them were always calling out to the Son of David, the kingdom of God, the covenant of the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God, and to have mercy. These guys, were they knew who he was, and they were looking to take hold of this. Of course, the many charged him he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, for to have mercy on him. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called, and they called the blind man, said to him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. That is believing and knowing and having confidence. It wasn't like, well, I hope this works. Why would he cast away his garment? Because the blind were required to wear a garment as long as they were blind. He throwing away his garment means, I'm not blind anymore. I don't need this garment. Otherwise, he had confidence, believing that what was going to happen was that he was going to be healed and that he would not be blind anymore. Now that doesn't mean the fact that I'm just going to throw away anything in the natural and then that means that that's going to make my faith work automatically. No, it all matters whether you believe. You can throw away your garment, but if you don't believe, you're going to have to go put it right back on. You've got to believe. It's you believing. You believe, of course, this guy had absolute confidence. He rose and he came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said, What wilt that I shall do, I shall do unto thee? The blind men said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And he said, Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Notice, it wasn't Jesus' faith. He said it was his faith that made him whole. He immediately received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. That means your faith can make you whole. According to your faith will it be unto us. That's why God wants our faith to get developed. The Bible says our faith will grow exceedingly. And he wants us to have our faith so strong and growing so exceedingly that we come to the place where we know exactly what God will do in every situation. And immediately received his sight and followed Jesus. We see over in Mark chapter 16, when it talks about believers. Mark 16, 17, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out the devils. Every one of us are to cast out the demons. And the second part of verse 18 says, We lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. God wants you to cast out the demons, lay hands on the sick to release healing power to flow in. And after the Lord had been taken up, he was now seated at the right hand of God. They went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Confirming what? The word. Because they were preaching the word. This is why you give the word, and it's them acting on the word. The word is the key, because the word is the basis for faith, and that's what we do, and that's what God performs. That's why you must give them the word, and people must receive the word 
and believe that word to see the results. And God will confirm the word with signs following, and it will come to pass, praise God. We see that Jesus, he laid hands on people. And even in one case here, over here in Luke chapter 4, down in verse 40, when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him. There must have been quite a line. And he laid his hands on every one of them. Jesus didn't do one, well, I'll just pray for you all, one, my, my mass deal. No, he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. I've learned that God wants us to minister to people individually, every one of them. A lot of people don't take the time to do that. Every one of them, he ministered to them. And they got healed, praise God. The devils also came out of many crying out and saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God, you're rebuking them, suffer them not to speak, for they knew who he was. He was the Christ. So the demons come out of many as the demons were being cast out. Again, it comes down to people must hear the word and come to faith. The problem we see today is people have had so many wrong doctrinal things taught and they haven't really even come to the place of believing who he is. No wonder they don't see things. Luke 6, 17, when he came, a great mold of people came from Judea and Jerusalem, the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him first and to be healed of their diseases. So you've got to hear the word first. That produces hope in your soul and it produces faith in your heart through the word. And then as you believe that word and you act upon it, then they would get healed of their diseases. And those that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue, or power again, dunamis, out of him, and healed them all. Again, he is the healer of all. He's also the one who will raise the dead. Not too many Christians have raised the dead. But you know what? God wants Christians to raise the dead. As we develop, we're going to come to that place. Luke chapter 7, verse 11, It came to pass the day after he went in the city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. And when he, the, when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. He said, Weep not. He came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up. He spoke commanding words, and he is raised from the dead, and began to speak and delivered him to his mother. Jesus operated in mighty, mighty power. Luke 7, 21. Now one thing I'll add, Jesus had the Spirit without measure, it says in John chapter 3. All the gifts of the Spirit were operating in him. The body of Christ has the, has the Spirit combined together, and the gifts are all portioned out as he wills. But as, as God gets the gifts operating in your life, and we all come together, corporately, God wants to bring a mighty manifestation of the power of God and gifts operating through each one to bring forth what He purposes. The nine gifts of the Spirit, one of them is the gifts, plural, of healings, plural. They're both plural, which means you might have a gift of healing for cancer, you might have a gift of healing for uh, blind eyes, you might have a gift of healing for deaf ears, you might have a gift of healing for a new uh, you know, heart disease or whatever. You might have different gifts of healings. That's why you want to get yourself flowing in the power of God, get yourself filled up with the Holy Spirit, be a praiser, a worshiper of God, pray in tongues, so that, and, get the, and stir up the gifts that are within you and, and see the gifts of the Holy Spirit begin to operate in your life. So, in that same hour, it cured many of their infirmities, plagues, evil spirits, and many that were blind, he gave sight. And Jesus answered and said, Go your way, tell John the things you've seen and heard, how the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. There wasn't any limitation to the gospel or the power of God, and it hasn't changed a bit. In Luke chapter 8, he's going and he's preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And it says, certain women have been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. A lot of times women have got a lot of hurts, wounds, damage, emotions from a lot of things that have been done to them. Notice it said they were healed of evil spirits and they were also healed of infirmities. So that would refer to the sickness and diseases, these infirmities. The evil spirits were the spirits that came into them. And this certainly would also 
talk about how they got healed of the hurts and wounds and damaged emotions that came into them. They got healed of the evil spirits. That's why we cast out the demons to see people be set free. Luke chapter 10. We come over here and he points, not, he had just not the 12. Now he's appointing the 70 and sending them forth to do these things. They go forth. And as they are going forth in verse 9, he said, Heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Again, what's, our, what's the central theme? The kingdom. You have to know that the kingdom is the central theme. The rule and the reign of God has come, and you've got to know who you are. You're a king. You are in the kingdom. You are to rule and reign under the lordship of Jesus. And you are to do the mighty works of the Lord and heal the sick that are therein. But again, remember, if they don't respond in faith, you're not going to do anything. It's they're going to have to have faith and believe the word of God to see things come to pass. So you don't want to get off on track and say, well, I'll just go lay hands on everybody that comes and I'll just believe, expect they're going to automatically be healed. No, you're going to teach them and preach the gospel to them. And they're going to come to the place of responding. They have to get born again and come to the place of responding in faith to see this happen. This is why you've got to do things God's way, locate people spiritually, be sure they get born again, they get right. They've got to deal with their sins or they're not going to see anything happen. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. The 70 again turned with, returned with joy, saying, Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. They were casting out the demons as well. He said, I give unto you authority. Power is the word exousia, authority to tread on serpents, scorpions, over all the power of the enemy. You and I have authority over all the power of the enemy and can see God bring forth victory over every work of the enemy. Luke eleven fourteen. 14, he was casting out a devil and it was dumb. It came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. That showed it was a process of him casting it out. It didn't just leave immediately. When the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and he was set free. Praise God. We see this case over in Luke chapter 13, over in verse 11, where a woman had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. And when it talks about had, this is the same word talking about it's translated possessed in other places in Acts chapter 8 verse 7 and Acts chapter 16 verse 16 the one who was possessed with devils or possessed with a spirit of divination it could have very well been translated possessed with a spirit of infirmity or having or being held by a spirit of infirmity was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself Jesus call, saw her and called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. A lot of people have not understood what was going on here. They assumed that if well, I just say you're loose from your infirmity, that that'll do the whole deal. What happened was, when he said you are loosed from your infirmity, what was he saying? Was he releasing power at that point through his word to untie the spirit of infirmity? No. How do we know? Because you've got to look up what the tense of the voice and the voice of the mood is. The tense of the verb is the perfect tense. The perfect tense in the Greek means that which has happened in the past, completed action in the past, with present results at the time of speaking. So Jesus is saying, as Young's brings it out, thou hast been loose from thine infirmity. He's saying, in the past, you've been loose from your infirmity and it has present effects right now. What, ha what was in the past that was established that would cause her to be in a position where she could be free from that infirmity? It's the covenant. In the covenant, she had a right to be healed and to be delivered of, of the infirmity because he's a healer. He's a deliverer. So th what that statement was declaring what her covenant right was, essentially. You have been loosed from your infirmity. Otherwise, you've got a covenant with God. It is, it's available for you right now. He laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. He released healing power to flow into her. Also, through the laying on of hands, can release anointing that would also drive out evil spirits. It can do that. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. It doesn't say that he spoke to the demons to cast them out. He very well may have. We do know that it was Satan who had the person bound, because it goes on and it says down here, in verse 16, I thought this woman being a daughter of Abraham, and that's a key, why he said, you have been loosed. What's he saying? You've got a covenant with God. 
and he's saying, this one's a daughter of Abraham. She's got a covenant with God. She already has a right to be free from this. Whom Satan hath bound these eighteen years, 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. And it was. He released the healing power of God into her, and she was made straight. He certainly, it doesn't say cast out, but certainly he must have released anointing to drive the spirits out. And they can be released out. De demons can come out through laying on of hands by anointing that's transferred. We know that, and we'll take you over to this for a moment, in Acts chapter 19, that anointing can be released through a transmission of some article, clothing, like where it says Paul, Paul from his body were brought into the sick. This is Acts 19, 12, and 13. Uh, that his body were brought into the sick, handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. This is where God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Through his hands, laying hands on that, released anointing that went and brought healing and also brought deliverance. So deliverance can occur in these ways just as well. And this was Jesus' regular ministry of casting out demons and healing the sick. That means it's to be the regular ministry of all of us. Luke chapter 13, over in verse 32. This is when they, were tell they came to him when he was coming to Jerusalem. And they, the Pharisees came and said, Get thee out, Herod, depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And the devil's always trying to do anything possible to stop you from following the things of God. Jesus was coming in because he was going to go to the cross. He was presenting himself as the Lamb of God that was taking away the sin of the world. Now he was teaching them. He was being tried by them in the midst of, you know, being tested. And, of course, he says, you go, go and tell that fox, I cast out devils and do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. That's the day he would be on the cross, and then he would be die and, and go on to, of course, accomplish the redemption. What is normal ministry. I'm going to cast out devils and do cures today, just like every other day. I'm going to keep doing the works of God. God wants us to be casting out demons and doing cures every day as we're ministering to people that we come in contact with. It's to be the regular ministry of the church. Luke chapter 17, over in verse 11. Here's where he came to the midst of Samaria, passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And at a certain village, there met him ten, ten, men that, ten, ten men that were lepers that stood afar off, lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So here, they're looking for the mercy again. And they're calling him Master. He says, when he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. Well, they had to believe that healing came into them because if you went and showed your, why did you go show yourself to a priest? That meant you were cleansed, you could come back into society. It came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. That meant as soon as they turned to go, they couldn't doubt. Well, it hadn't happened yet. Should we keep going? I've gone a few steps or a little ways. They had to believe and stick with it. You're going to have to believe and stick with it with whatever you're doing, praying and casting out and doing things, knowing that the manifestation will come. As they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, glorified God, fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. He was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? He expected they'd all do it. What was wrong with these other guys? They should have been, you know, glorifying him. They're not found that return to give glory to God save this stranger. Remember, he was a Samaritan. He said unto them, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Because he gave thanks unto him. His faith was not put in operation for him to receive even a greater miracle, not just the cleansing, but he was made whole of the effects of what that would do, where it eats away parts of the body, leprosy does. Jesus accomplished this great work. We see over in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, we pick up over in verse 47. He comes out here, and this one man comes down, and he wanted Jesus to heal his son. He was at the point of death. Another one was about dead. He said, except you see signs and wonders, you'll not believe. When he heard that Jesus was come down, or, I'm sorry, the nobleman said, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus said, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Then when the man had to believe, didn't he? 
If he didn't believe, it wasn't going to happen. He believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And what happened? As he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, Thy son liveth. And he inquired of them the hour when he began to amend. So it didn't happen immediately. It was apparently a process. And they said unto him, uh, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. Well, that was when he began to amend, of course. So the father knew it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, My son liveth and himself believed in his whole house. Praise God. God is a healer of all things. Jesus He'll do mighty works. John chapter 5. Here we see where these ones with a great imp multitude of impotent folk, the blind, the halt, the withered, the waiting for the moving of the water. Angel would come down a certain season, the pool troubled the water. Whoever got in first was made whole of whatever disease he was. So a certain man was there. He had infirmity for 38 years. He was in that state. Jesus, uh, verse 6, Jesus saw him. He knew that he'd been now a long time in the case. He said to him, Wilt thou be made whole? That's all he wanted to know. Will you be made whole? I'm coming. I'm the one that can bring healing to you. You don't need to wait for any moving in the water now. The impotent man answered and said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Otherwise, you don't have to wait for that. You can be healed right now. Immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked. He was healed and he was restored. But you know, this man, obviously it was his sins that caused his problem. Because down in verse 14, Jesus found him in the temple. And he said to him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto you. That means you can't receive your healing if you're abiding in sin. And you won't retain your healing if you go back into any areas of sin. That's why God expects every one of us to conquer all sin in every areas of our life. If we don't, you know, we've got to be right with Him. Otherwise, we're not going to see things happen. He wants us to be set free. Praise God. Over in John, chapter 9, saw a man that was blind from his birth. And the disciples said, Master, who did sin? Because they knew it was sin that would cause it, because sin always opens up the door for something to happen. This man, well, if he's blind from birth, how could the man have sinned? He couldn't do anything. That's kind of a dumb question to begin with, but they ask it anyway. Or his parents, assuming, well, it must have been his parents that did this, that he was born blind. It's kind of a dumb question, in a way, asking about the man. So Jesus answered, and he told, he just answered their question. He didn't tell them what was the cause of it. He just answered their question. And people, that's what we need to see instead of reading into it. Neither at this man sin nor his parents. There should be a period here because that was the end of the statement. The punctuation was put in by translators at a later time. There's no punctuation in the Greek. You have to look at the statements and determine what's been said before you start the next sentence. He answered the question. Neither of this man sinned nor his parents. That's where there should be a, a period. But the, because the next things he said and what follows is all another thought. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me. <coughs> Otherwise, Jesus was going to work the works of God. Some people have thought, well, it wasn't the man sin and parents sin. God must have done that to him. No, God doesn't make people blind. God's not the one who does those kind of things. Sin, it probably was a previous generation curse. Not the parents, but could have been a great grandparent or somebody previously, but it certainly would have been some way of that. He just didn't tell them the answer. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work. Of course, the man ended up getting healed, and so he spake, spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, which makes you think that that was a creative miracle, because what are, our, what are we made of, of the clay, of the dust of the ground? He must have needed a new eye or something, because creative miracles can be done. That's why he put the spittle, puts it on his eyes. He must have created a brand new eyeball, or whatever was missing there. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. 
He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Praise God. He was blind, but now he was healed and restored. We also see over in the book of Acts, we'll just look at a couple things here for a moment. Acts chapter 3. Did they do the mighty works in the early church? You better believe they did. Peter and John went up together in the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Now, this isn't Jesus now. This is Peter and John. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them to enter in the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go in the temple, asking alms, and fastening his eyes upon them, said, Look on us. He gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. He thought he was going to get some money. But such as I have, give I thee. What did he have? He had power and authority. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He spoke in the name of Jesus, releasing that authority. And he spoke the word of God, which released the power of God. He declared, commanded this man to rise up and walk. And then he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. He spoke it, he lifts him up, and the guy is healed. Healing power went into him, and he was restored. He leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them in the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. And later on in verse 16, he describes to them and tells them how this happened. He says, His name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you. The faith which is by him, talking about Jesus, gave him this perfect soundness in the presence. It's the name of Jesus, but you have to have faith in the name of Jesus. If you do not believe and have faith that it's going to happen and know what the name of Jesus will do, it won't happen. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, well, these guys had a prayer meeting. In fact, he said, Behold their threatenings, grant thy servants, with all boldness they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done. How that's, how's it going to be done? By the name. That's why you always do things in the name. By the name of thy holy child, Jesus. So when they play, prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost for the service of the Lord. Not when the Holy Spirit came to dwell in them. The filling is for the service of the Lord. Ongoing work in our life. And they spake the word of God with boldness, which does what? Releases the power of God. And it talks about in verse 32, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection, and great grace was upon them. Great power and favor was going forth. And what do we see happen? We see over in Acts chapter 5, beginning here in verse 12, it says, By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. They did the same works. This is the early church. Remember, the latter church is to have the double portion anointing compared to the early church. Believers were more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women, insomuch they brought forth the sick into the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. They were ministering to him, even the man manifest power of God from his shadow was bringing healing. That meant they had power operating in them mightily. There also came a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. They were doing the same thing that Jesus did. What's that got to do with us? Remember that the glory of God on the latter house, the latter church, is going to be greater than upon the former. Jesus is not going to come back until the glory of God is manifest in the end time remnant church that is going to walk in his ways and there will be a greater demonstration of the mighty power of God than there was in the former church. Healings, deliverances, casting out demons, raising the dead, seeing people be set free. God is going to do a great and mighty work. But what's going to have to happen? Well, in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, they found these guys were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And it says also that they were full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, as Stephen was. And it talks about how, as they went forth, Stephen, who was full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Full of it. That means you've got to get rid of everything. 
that's not of faith, of power, of the Holy Spirit, they're full of wisdom as well. Things aren't going to happen if we got all this other stuff. It's going to it's going to contaminate you. Things of the world contaminate you. Sin contaminates you from being able to do these things. God's a holy God who's going to operate through a holy people. That's why the only ones who are going to be doing this are going to be the people that are holy, that are going to be full of faith, full of power, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Ghost, and they are going to see great signs and wonders and great miraculous things that happen. Amen. Philip, he went for it, and he did the mighty works of the Lord, preached the Christ to them. People gave heed to what he was doing, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. Unclean spirits cry with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with him. He's casting out the demons. Many taken with the palsy that were lame were healed. He's doing the mighty works of the Lord. We see over in Acts chapter 9, remember the Lord's the one who's doing this through us. Here we see Peter. Peter coming in verse 33, found a certain man named Aeneas, kept his bed eight years. He's bedridden for eight years. Sick of the palsy. He said, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise, make thy bed. Who's making you whole? Jesus is making you whole right now. And you speak it into being. Told him to rise and make his bed, and he arose immediately. And Peter, he raised one from the dead. Tabitha, a woman full of good works and alms deeds, in verse 36, came to pass she was sick and died. It laid her in the upper chamber. Well, Peter was close by. And per disciples heard Peter was there. They sent him to him. Two men desiring he'd come. Peter arose, went with him. He comes in the upper chamber. All the widows stood by him weeping, showing the coats and garments that Dor Dorcas made while she was with him. And Peter put them all forth. He didn't need anybody that didn't ha wasn't going to be in faith. You got to have people that are in faith. Put them all forth. Otherwise, it's going to be someone who's going to be in faith that can do this. Kneeled down and prayed, turning to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when he saw Peter, she sat up and she was healed, raised from the dead. Gave her his hand, lifted her up, called the saints and widows and presented her alive. Raised her from the dead. God wants us to realize he's going to do the same thing. He's going to do the same thing in the end time church before the end comes. Acts 14, verse 8, there's one at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from the mother's womb. He never walked. He same heard Paul speak, steadfastly behold, and perceiving he had faith to be healed. Notice, you've got to teach the people so that they have faith to be healed. And when he saw it was faith to be healed, he's going to get this guy, well, you have faith to be healed. Get up, let's, let's see this manifest. Stand upright on thy feet. And he we leaped and walked, and he was healed but he had to have faith to be healed. And we saw that one about the special miracles that happened through the hands of Paul, through, it was so powerful, the anointing, the special miracles by the hand of Paul, the handkerchiefs and the aprons, aprons were taken from his body. The anointing was then put upon the people, diseases departed from and evil spirits went out of them. And one last scripture over in Acts 28. Acts 28, we see over here in verse 8, when Paul he comes here, he keeps going place after place, and he comes where the father of Publius lay was sick of a fever and a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. He healed, healing power. So when this was done, others also, which had disease in the island, came and were healed. These guys were doing the same things that Jesus did. So don't think it's just Jesus. Well, what are you and I? We're believers in Jesus Christ. He wants you and I to become walking in the ways of the Lord, full of the power of God, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom, full of faith. Get rid of everything that's not of the Lord. Be holy. Get rid of every areas of sin out of your life. Be a vessel for God to flow through. And as he's accomplishing this great work, there's going to be the glory of God is going to be poured out on the end time church, and there will be greater signs and wonders, healings, deliverance, raising of the dead, miraculous works that are going to come. Praise God. Get your mind set on all the things that God's going to do. And He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'll heal you today. He's a healer today. He's a healer every day. He'll cast out the demons every day. He does the mighty works of the Lord. He wants us to do it. As you develop and your faith becomes mighty and strong, 
and you get full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom and full of power, full of all these things, then we're going to see works being done more and more and mightier and mightier as we go down these last days. Say this, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the Word of God that reveals the authority and power that Jesus operated in. It brought healings and deliverances, destroying every work of the enemy. And I see that the disciples, the 70, and the people in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, believers, did the same works. I thank you. I'm a believer. I can do the same works. He said, the works that I do, shall you do also. I thank you, Lord, that I can receive healing through my faith. I can cast out the demons. I can do the works of God. And I'm going to do them because I am a believer. I'm going to get full of power, full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. And I'm going to eliminate everything that is not of the Lord so I can be a vessel that God can manifest himself through. Thank you, Lord. I will receive with my faith deliverance and healing, even creative miracles. And I will be a vessel for you to flow through to bring forth deliverance and healing to set the captives free. Thank you, Father, for accomplishing your word in me to produce healing and through me to minister it to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. It's powerful looking at what Jesus did. He hadn't changed a bit, and he'll do the same thing today, and he'll do it through you and me. Father, we thank you for all you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of your word. We thank you that we will grow and develop in all things, and we will see the manifestation of your deliverance and healing in our life and doing the mighty works. Thank you, Father. We're going to have our eyes on the Word. We will never doubt or wonder. We will believe and we will do what you say and we will see the great and mighty work of the Lord accomplished in us and through us. Thank you. There will be much fruit as we hear and do this Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you need prayer, I invite you to come forward. Otherwise, God bless. Meditate on these things. Do what God says. Continue to develop yourself in the things of the Lord. Continue to cast out. Take hold of the healing. Take hold of everything and minister to people. Because you're going to grow and get stronger and stronger and stronger. And praise God for what he is going to do in the body of Christ in these last days. God bless. You're dismissed. Have a great week as you are walking in the ways of the power and authority of God. In Jesus' name.